It's a pleasure to be with you. The title of this session is Origins of Public Health, Part 1. There are no disclosures for this presentation. Objectives include review the six eras of public health, discuss the impact of the Industrial Revolution on the sensibility of public health, review the classification of health problems, review a few reports and interviews regarding living and working conditions in England during the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century. Let's start by reviewing the six eras of public health. One, health protection from antiquity to the 1830s that focused on authority-based control of individuals and communities and prohibition of certain behaviors. Two, hygiene movement from 1840 to the 1870s focused on implementation of sanitary control of infectious diseases. Three, contagious disease control from 1880 to the 1940s focused on the application of infectious disease germ theory and techniques to control infections. Four, filling medical care system holes from the 1940s to the mid 1980s, focused on the integration of various disciplines to control infectious diseases, along with modification of risk factors associated with chronic diseases. Five, health promotion and disease prevention from the mid 1980s to 2000, focused on changing the behaviors of individuals and protection of vulnerable populations. Six, population health from 2000 to the present, focused on the environment, collaborations and partnerships, and systems thinking to control and prevent infectious and chronic diseases. Let's discuss the health protection era for a few minutes. The health protection era lasted from antiquity to the 1830s. The earliest civilizations integrated their concepts of prevention into their culture, religion, and laws. Some cultures prohibited or strongly discouraged eating certain foods, Jewish culture with pork, Indian subcontinent cultures with beef, and East African tribes like the Maasai with fish. Cannibalism was nearly universally prohibited by most cultures. One possible reason could have been that cannibalism practiced by certain tribes was noted to be associated with central nervous system dementing fatal diseases. Kuru could have been one of those diseases. It was scientifically identified in the 1950s in the 4A people of New Guinea, one of the rare tribes who ate human brains as part of a funeral ritual. Some cultures prohibited or limited the use of alcohol to control unwanted behaviors. Some sexual activities thought associated with poor health resulted in various religious, cultural, and legal practices, including premarital abstinence, marital fidelity, and ritualistic male and female circumcision. Quarantine and isolation separates exposed or afflicted individuals from others and was used to help control the Black Plague in Europe. Quarantine was used by some cultures to control leprosy. The biblical book of Leviticus chapter 13 describes the ancient Jewish protocol for diagnosing and handling leprosy, including quarantine. If anyone notices a swelling in his skin, or a scab, or a boil, or pimple, with transparent skin, leprosy is to be suspected. He must be brought to Aaron the priest, or to one of his sons, for the spot to be examined. If the hair in the spot turns white, and if the spot looks to be more than skin deep, it is leprosy, and the priest must declare him a leper. If a man is burned in some way, and the burn place becomes bright reddish white or white, then the priest must examine the spot. If the hair in the bright spot turns white, and the problem seems to be more than skin deep, it is leprosy that is broken out from the burn, 
and the priest must pronounce him a leper. Anyone who is discovered to have leprosy must tear his clothes and let his hair grow in wild disarray and cover his upper lip and call out as he goes, I am a leper, I am a leper. As long as the disease lasts, he is defiled and must live outside the camp, a fairly severe form of quarantine and stigmatization. If leprosy is suspected in a woolen or linen garment or fabric, or in a piece of leather or leather work, and there is a greenish or a reddish spot in it, it is probably leprosy and must be taken to the priest to be examined. The priest will put it away for seven days and look at it again on the seventh day. If the spot is spread, it is a contagious leprosy, and he must burn the clothing, fabric, linen, or woolen covering, or leather article, for it is contagious and must be destroyed by fire. We know that the presence of white hair is relatively common on wound edges due to the damage of pigmented cells. There are many non-leprous and non-contagious causes of the conditions described in Leviticus 13. The biblical use of the term leprosy applied to many skin afflictions, not just Hansen's disease caused by Mycobacteria leprae, a relative of tuberculosis. The use of quarantine in these passages is excessively aggressive and once again underlines the importance of science in making good, informed public health decisions. In 1740, a British naval commander, James Lind, discovered that providing sailors with lemons and other citrus fruits during long voyages prevented scurvy. The picture shows the bleeding gums and periodontal problems associated with scurvy. He was providing vitamin C even though vitamins had not yet been identified. Edward Jenner was an English physician who developed the world's first vaccine. The terms vaccine and vaccination are derived from variola vaccinae, the virus that causes the pox-like illness in cattle. Vacciniae was the term Jenner used to denote the cowpox illness. He used cowpox from infected pustules from cattle in 1796 to vaccinate people, starting with a dairy maid named Sarah Nelms. These vaccinations prevented smallpox when vaccinated individuals were exposed to people who had disease. Jenner is called the father of immunology. His work is said to have saved more lives than the work of any other human. In Jenner's time, smallpox killed around 10% of the general population, with that number as high as 20% in towns and cities where infections spread more easily. The lower picture on this slide demonstrates the classic rash of smallpox. All of these approaches to disease prevention were used before organized public health existed. Public health awareness started to grow in Europe and the United States in the mid-1800s with the idea that social conditions of inequality were associated with health and wellness issues. Introducing the concept of social justice and public health's focus on vulnerable populations. Next, let's consider the hygiene movement era for a few minutes. This era had a focus on sanitation, even though the germ theory had not yet been developed. The fundamental concepts of epidemiology developed during this era. John Snow, who lived from 1800 to 1899, was an anesthesiologist by training. John Snow is known as the father of the field of epidemiology. He studied the cholera epidemic in London and identified the cause, contaminated water associated with the Broad Street pump circled on the map. 
Each mark on the map is the physical location of a case of cholera and helped Snow deduce that the pump was essentially the geographic center of the epidemic and could likely be the culprit. His method was what is termed in epidemiology a natural experiment that is still commonly used today. A natural experiment is defined as a naturally occurring circumstance in which subsets of a population have different levels of exposure to a supposed causal factor in a situation resembling an actual experiment where human subjects would be randomly allocated to groups. This slide lists the major contributions John Snow made to the field of epidemiology, including the powers of observation and written expression, description of epidemiologic methods, including mapping and data tables to describe the outbreak, the use of the natural experiment epidemiologic method, developing recommendations based on the data, using that data to develop a practical solution to the problem. In this case, remove the pump handle, which Snow did. His actions quickly terminated the epidemic. This picture is the famous Broad Street pump with the handle removed. There were other events that impacted the hygiene movement in the mid-1800s. Semmelweis was an Austrian physician who sought to control puerperal fever or fever during childbirth. Puerperal fever was a major cause of maternal mortality in Europe and the United States. Semmelweis noted the association of puerperal fever with physicians who went straight from the autopsy room to the delivery room without washing their hands. He instituted strict hand washing and documented a dramatic decline in puerperal fever in his institution. Unfortunately, his practice was not adopted by medical colleagues until the germ theory was later described by Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch. Vital statistics of birth and death records were developed in England in the mid-1800s. Vital statistics established a basis for population-wide assessment of health status. From the onset, there was a spirited discussion over how to define the cause of death. Edwin Chadwick argued for specific pathologic conditions or diseases as the causal basis, where William Farr argued for underlying risk factors, including social conditions, as the real cause of death. The American Public Health Association, APHA, was formed in 1872 and identified two main goals. One, advocacy for scientific advances related to the health of the public, and two, public education to improve community health. Let's now consider the contagious disease control era. This era ran from approximately 1880 to the 1940s. Identification of the germ theory was the major focus of this period. Louis Pasteur identified and postulated that germs caused several diseases as early as 1860. The practical application of that theory related to the work of Robert Koch in 1890. Koch proposed four postulates that defined infectious causes of disease. This slide lists the four Koch postulates. One, the same microorganisms are present in every case of a disease. Two, the microorganisms are isolated from the tissues of a dead animal and a pure culture is prepared. Three, microorganisms from the pure culture are inoculated into a healthy, susceptible animal. The disease is reproduced in that animal. Four, the identical microorganisms are isolated and recultivated from the tissue specimens of the experimental animal. 
This era also saw the merging of the new field of epidemiology started by John Snow's work, germ theory and immunology, resulting in public programs to control infectious diseases like tuberculosis. Scientists could now identify tuberculosis by a skin test, culture, and chest x-ray. Many tuberculosis sanatoriums were developed during this period of public health history. New toxin vaccines against tetanus and diphtheria were developed. Without antibiotics, control of infectious diseases was the priority with public health focusing on prevention, isolation, and case finding to further prevent spread. In the early 20th century, Dr. Joseph Goldberger, a physician in the U.S. government's hygienic laboratory, the predecessor of the National Institutes of Health, identified the cause of pellagra, a vitamin B6 or niacin deficiency, in poor southern sharecroppers, tenant farmers, and mill workers due to deficient diets. Pellagra causes skin, mucosal, and mental symptoms and signs. His work contradicted medical thinking of the time that attributed the cause to an infectious agent. The link of pellagra to poverty underlined the importance of the social determinants of health and social justice in public health. The 1920s and 30s saw significant advances not only in the understanding of contagious diseases, but also in vitamin and nutrition research. The next era is filling medical care system holes, which extended from the 1940s to approximately the mid-1980s. Penicillin was discovered in 1928 by Scottish scientist Alexander Fleming but wasn't used in human medicine until 1942. The introduction and development of antibiotic therapy allowed clinicians to cure many infectious diseases. During this period, public health helped integrate preventive services into clinical practice. Randomized clinical trials emerged. The Food and Drug Administration developed the foundations for evidence-based public health and medicine. Epidemiological methods were developed for non-communicable diseases resulting in the 1964 Dr. Luther Terry Surgeon General's report linking tobacco use to cancer and the 1948 Framingham study linking high blood pressure, cholesterol, cigarette smoking, and obesity to cardiovascular disease. The Framingham study is currently evaluating its third cohort. Smallpox was officially recognized as eradicated in 1980. Eliminating smallpox was an incredible public health achievement. The last naturally acquired case was seen in Somalia in 1977. The last laboratory-related death from smallpox virus was in 1978 at the University of Birmingham, England, where they had six cases and three deaths. In 1980, the World Health Assembly of the World Health Organization certified the global eradication of smallpox. Eradication was not achieved by mass vaccination, but by a ring vaccination technique. There were three components to the ring vaccination concept. One, isolation of confirmed and suspected cases to further prevent spread. Two, identification, vaccination, and surveillance of significant contacts of proven cases, the first ring to prevent further spread. Three, vaccination of household contacts of contacts, the second ring or safety net. Smallpox immunization is 95 to 99 percent effective in preventing disease in those exposed. That's good, but not 100 percent. Therefore, the second ring was felt essential. Mass vaccination was considered an adjunct measure, if indicated.
Routine smallpox vaccination was discontinued in the U.S. in 1972 and generally discontinued in the world in 1982. The U.S. military discontinued vaccination in 1990. Select vaccination was reinstituted post 9-11 due to bioterrorism concerns. The next era is health promotion and disease prevention. This era lasted from approximately the mid 1980s to 2000 and focused on individual responsibility. Health promotion and disease prevention targeted individuals to affect behavioral change and reduce risk factors associated with disease. This would include cardiovascular risk factors identified in the Framingham study, high blood pressure, cholesterol, smoking, and obesity. Behavioral change strategies were also used to help prevent the spread of HIV AIDS. Health promotion was defined by the World Health Organization's Bangkok Charter for Health Promotion in a Globalized World as the process of enabling people to increase control over their health and its determinants and thereby improve their health, emphasizing the concept of individual responsibility. This slide is a representation of Pender's health promotion model. The first column lists personal and historical influences on behaviors, including prior experiences and personal biological, psychological, and socio-cultural factors. The middle column lists some specific cognitive influences, including a person's perceptions of benefits, barriers, efficacy, and activity-related impacts. Interpersonal influences of family, peers, models, societal and community norms, etc., situational influences, and immediate competing demands also have an impact as diagrammed. All of these influences ultimately impact individual decisions and the final output, health-related behaviors. Health promotion and disease prevention strategies aim at neutralizing negative and enhancing positive influences of this model. Screening efforts were emphasized in this era, like mammography to detect early breast cancer and pap smears for cervical cancer. Newborn screening for various genetic diseases was also implemented. Environmental movements enhanced public awareness of lead in gasoline and paint radon, holes in the ozone atmospheric layer, air pollution, etc. Reductions in air pollution and smoking had positive impacts on chronic lung disease, asthma, and coronary artery disease. That brings us to the final and current era of public health history, population health. Population health is transforming the way professionals and the public think about health. Community-wide or population-wide public health efforts are needed to address issues like bioterrorism, the opioid crisis, the high cost of health care, access to health care, control of pandemic influenza, HIV AIDS, suicide, disparities, climate change, emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases, environmental contamination, international health issues, etc. The new public health paradigm is individual responsibility coupled with community and population health. To understand how public health is practiced in the United States today, We'll consider the origins of the profession of modern public health that scholars attribute to the Industrial Revolution that accelerated during the late health protection and hygiene eras. Prior to industrialization, societies applied some public health principles by attempting to provide healthful conditions for people. The Romans built great aqueducts to bring clean water to cities. 
the Venetians, during the 17th and 18th centuries, locally controlled plague through the implementation of key public health measures. The Black Death was a pandemic occurring in Western Eurasia and North Africa from 1346 to 1353 and is considered the worst and most fatal pandemic recorded in human history, resulting in an estimated 75 to 200 million deaths. The Black Death, also known as bubonic plague, was caused by Yersinia pestis, a bacteria spread primarily by fleas. It can also be spread through person-to-person -person contact by aerosols from individuals manifesting pneumonic plague or infection of the lungs. This person-to-person -person spread is thought to be the reason it spread so quickly in the 14th century. The origin of the Black Death is unclear. The organism was likely introduced to Europe during the siege of Kaffa in Crimea by the Golden Horde Army of Johnny Begg in 1347. From Crimea, it was carried by fleas on rats inhabiting ships throughout the Mediterranean, North Africa, Western Asia, and Europe. The plague caused religious, social, and economic upheavals. This map shows the likely spread of the Black Death from Crimea, circled in red, to Western Asia, the Middle East, North Africa, and Europe. Venice, Italy suffered through more than 22 outbreaks of bubonic plague between the 14th and 18th centuries. In 1576 to 1577, the plague killed approximately 50,000 people or one third of the city's population. During the 17th and 18th centuries, measures were taken by the Venetian administration to combat the disease. Even though the scientific basis of plague was unknown, the Venetians recognized its transmissible nature and successfully decreased its spread by implementing an information network and activating a system of military inspection garrisons along the coast to control all local movements in plague-infested areas, essentially imposing quarantine and isolation protocols. Quarantine applies to those exposed to an infectious organism and isolation to those infected. In contrast to Venice, where the infection was controlled, the neighboring coast of mainland Greece, which was under Ottoman rule, experienced marked infections and deaths during the same period. So even in the absence of scientific knowledge, careful observation, and implementation of isolation and quarantine measures can effectively control infectious outbreaks. Industrialization in the 19th century encouraged the development of public health as a profession and helped define its identity, organization goals, methods, and sensibility. Sensibility for public health means that, in addition to preventing and controlling diseases and injuries, public health historically has aspired to social justice. Social justice translates into a more equitable distribution of wealth, opportunities, and privileges within society. Being intolerant of health disparities between those who have wealth, power, and status, and those who do not. This sensibility of social justice was clearly apparent in the early period of the Industrial Revolution and led to great social justice achievements of public health in the 19th and 20th centuries. Before continuing the review of public health origins, let's discuss a basic classification scheme for health problems. Health problems can be divided into two broad categories, diseases and injuries. Diseases are further classified as infectious or non-infectious. Infectious diseases are caused by pathogenic microorganisms, bacteria, viruses, fungi, multicellular parasites, and prions. 
Infectious diseases can be communicable and contagious. A communicable disease is an infectious disease such as cholera, hepatitis, influenza, malaria, measles, or tuberculosis that is transmissible by contact with infected individuals or their bodily discharges or fluids, such as respiratory droplets, blood, or semen, by contact with contaminated surfaces or objects, by ingestion of contaminated food or water, or by direct or indirect contact with disease vectors, such as mosquitoes, fleas, or mice. Contagious diseases are a subcategory of communicable diseases, those that are spread via direct contact with an infected person, person-to-person -person transmission. Non-infectious diseases are those not caused by a pathogenic microbe, but by factors that are not communicable or contagious, such as environmental exposures to toxins, nutritional deficiencies, health behaviors, and genetic inheritance. They include dietary and autoimmune conditions, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, as well as hereditary diseases such as hemophilia, mental health conditions such as depression, anxiety, and others are non-infectious. Many non-infectious diseases are also called chronic diseases. The CDC defines chronic disease as conditions that last one year or more and require ongoing medical attention or limit activities of daily living or both. Chronic diseases such as heart disease, cancer, and diabetes are the leading causes of death and disability in the United States. Some infectious diseases meet the chronic disease definition, including chronic hepatitis B and C, HIV, and long COVID. Injuries are another broad category of non-infectious health problems and can be further divided into intentional and unintentional injuries. Intentional injuries can be self-inflicted or caused by others and include suicide, homicide, substance abuse, domestic violence, child and elder abuse, etc. Unintentional injuries can be self-inflicted or caused by others. The most common unintentional injuries result from motor vehicle crashes, but the home and workplace are sites of many unintentional injuries as well, including burns, falls, drownings, poisonings, and lacerations. Gathering and analyzing health data with these classifications in mind facilitates the understanding of health problems and the development of strategies to address and prevent them. Let's spend a few more minutes discussing the origins of modern public health emerging during the Industrial Revolution. Let's start by considering living conditions in English cities where industrialization first took place. During industrialization, cities grew rapidly as factories replaced the former domestic production system, beginning with textiles, crowded housing, grossly inadequate sanitation, contaminated water, and poor diets amplified infectious diseases and epidemics. Work consisted of long days in unsafe and poorly ventilated factories, often exposing workers to toxic substances. In the 1800s, London was an unsavory place to live for most people. The smells of raw sewage, horse and cattle manure, slaughterhouses, unwashed bodies, and coal fires filled the air. Fog from the smoke of these fires made breathing difficult. Housing was cramped, often airless, and without a clean water supply or sanitary disposal of garbage and sewage. Diet was poor. Dr. Vinnan, a medical officer of health in 1856 wrote, in one small, miserably dirty, dilapidated room occupied by a man, his wife, and four children, in which they lived day and night, was a child in its coffin that had died of measles 11 days before, and although decomposition was going on, it had not even been fastened down. 
The excuse made for its not having been buried before was that burials by the parish did not take place unless there were more than one to convey away at a time. In another miserable apartment, scarce seven feet wide, lived five persons, and in which there was not one atom of furniture of any kind. The room contained nothing but a heap of filthy rags on the floor. The front door is never closed day or night, and in consequence the staircase and landing form a nightly resort for thieves and prostitutes where every kind of nuisance is committed. There are two yards at the back of this house, in each of which is an open privy. One of them is so abominably filthy and emitted a smell so foul that I was almost overpowered. Factories of the period were grim places to work. Many interviews with adult and child laborers testify to the conditions that often led to injury, permanent disability, and disease. Long hours, little rest, poor ventilation, exposure to dangerous equipment and chemicals, and harsh enforcement of workplace rules were the norm. There is no substitute for the words of those who experience the conditions themselves. John Burley, a worker in a 19th century mill, was interviewed by the Ashton Chronicle in 1849 about his life in Cressbrook Mill, where he began working when he was about seven years old. This is what he said. Our regular time was from five in the morning till nine or 10 at night, and on Saturday till 11 and often 12 o'clock at night, and then we were sent to clean the machinery on the Sunday. We went to the mill at five o'clock and worked till about eight or nine when they brought us our breakfast, which consisted of water porridge with oat cake in it and onions to flavor it. Dinner consisted of Derbyshire oat cakes cut into four pieces and ranged into two stacks. One was buttered and the other treckled. By the side of the oat cake were cans of milk. We drank the milk, and with the oat cake in our hand, we went back to work without sitting down. Factory accidents were common. Unguarded machinery was a major problem for children working in factories. One hospital reported that every year it treated nearly a thousand people for wounds and mutilations caused by machines in factories. A report commissioned by the House of Commons in 1832 said that there are factories no means few in number nor confined to the smaller mills in which serious accidents are continually occurring and in which, notwithstanding, dangerous parts of the machinery are allowed to remain unfenced. The report added that the workers were often abandoned from the moment that an accident occurs. Their wages are stopped. No medical attendance is provided and whatever the extent of the injury, no compensation is afforded. In 1842, a German visitor noted that he had seen so many people in the streets of Manchester without arms and legs that it was like living in the midst of the army just returned from a campaign. Poorly ventilated factory buildings were another serious problem. A report published in July 1833 stated that most factories were dirty, low-roofed, ill-ventilated, ill-drained, no conveniences for washing or dressing, no contrivance for carrying off dust and other effluvia. Doctors were concerned about the dust from flax and the flu from cotton in the air that young workers breathed. Most young workers complained of feeling sick during their first few weeks of working in a factory. This initial reaction to factory pollution became known as mill fever, with symptoms including generally feeling ill and headaches. Bisonosis was a risk for those working in cotton mills. Factory workers inhaling cotton or jute fiber dust in inadequately ventilated environments can develop bisonosis and occupational lung disease. Symptoms of bisonosis include cough, difficult breathing, chest tightness, and wheezing. Long-term exposures can result in lung scarring and chronic lung disease. Child labor in textile factories and coal mines 
was perhaps the most appalling fact of the early period of industrialization. Let's review a few interviews conducted for government investigations into working conditions of children. The first interview is of Charles Aberdeen, who was interviewed by Michael Sadler and his House of Commons Committee on July 23, 1832. Question, how young have you known children go into silk mills? Answer, I've known three at six years of age, but very few at that age. Question, what were your hours of labor? Answer, from six in the morning till seven at night. Question, was it found necessary to beat children to keep them up to their employment? Answer, certainly. Question, did the beating increase towards evening? Answer, their strength relaxes more towards the evening. They get tired and they twist themselves about on their legs and stand on the sides of their feet. Question, as an overlooker, did you stimulate them to labor by severity? Answer, certainly. My employer always considered this indispensable. Question, did you not find it very irksome to your feelings to have to take those means of urging the children to do the work? Answer, extremely so. I have been compelled to urge them on to work when I knew they could not bear it but I was obliged to make them strain every nerve to do the work. And I can say I have been disgusted with myself and with my situation. I felt myself degraded and reduced to the level of a slave driver in such cases. Question. Is not tying the broken ends or piecing an employment that requires great activity? Answer. Yes. Question. Does not the material often cut the hands of those poor children? Answer, frequently, but some more than others. I have seen them stand at their work with their hands cut till the blood has been running down to the ends of their fingers. Question, is there more work required of the children than there used to be when you first knew the business? Answer, yes, on account of the competition that exists between masters, one undersells the other. Consequently, the master endeavors to get an equal quantity of work done for less money. Eliza Marshall was born in Doncaster in 1815. At the age of nine, her family moved to Leeds, where she found work at a local textile factory. Eliza was interviewed by Michael Sattler and his House of Commons Committee on May 26, 1832. Eliza had some skeletal deformities caused by her work at the factory. Question, what were your hours of work? Answer, when I first went to the mill, we worked from six in the morning till seven in the evening. After a time, we began at five in the morning and worked till 10 at night. Question, were you very much fatigued by the length of labor? Answer, yes. Question, did they beat you? Answer, when I was younger, they used to do it often. Question, did the labor affect your limbs? Answer, yes. When we worked over hours, I was worse by a great deal. I had stuff to rub my knees, and I used to rub my joints a quarter of an hour and sometimes an hour or two. Question, were you straight before that? Answer, yes, I was. My master knows that well enough. And when I have asked for my wages, he said that I could not run about as I had been used to do. Question, are you crooked now? Answer, yes. I have an iron on my leg. My knee is contracted. Question, have the surgeons in the infirmary told you by what your deformity was occasioned? Answer, yes. One of them said it was by standing. The marrow was dried out of the bone so that there is no natural strength in it. Question, you were quite straight till you had to labor so long in those mills? Answer, yes, I was as straight as anyone. From these reports and interviews, we have a picture of the squalid living and working conditions in industrialized cities of Europe, the United States, and other countries during the 19th century that led to infectious disease outbreaks increased risk of non-infectious conditions and injuries. In addition, 
The wages that families received were often insufficient to pay for better housing and healthful foods. In summary, the profession of modern public health is attributed to the Industrial Revolution during the late health protection and hygiene eras. Squalid living and working conditions in industrialized cities of Europe, the United States, and other countries during the 19th century led to infectious disease outbreaks, increased risk of non-infectious conditions, and injuries. In the absence of scientific knowledge, careful observation and implementation of isolation and quarantine measures can effectively control infectious outbreaks. Social justice translates into a more equitable distribution of wealth, opportunities, and privileges within society.